When you see this configuration out, you know it's galaxy season. This is my astrophysics. This is the longest focal length I can achieve with a Barlow on the Astrophysics 130 EDF Gran Turismo. And so this is what I'm gonna to use tonight. We are targeting, of course, Comet 2019 Y4 Atlas. Gonna start with M81, but really I'd like to see if the night can hold up and get into M51. I'd really love to add some high quality luminance data to my M51. This is the Astrophysics Mach 1 go-to mount, and on top I use the SG4 Auto Guider. It's so simple, it's just a push of a button and this sucker works. So this is our configuration for tonight. And for any time I'm going galaxy hunting. Hi everyone and welcome back to the channel and thank you so much to all the new subscribers we've had on the channel. It's been pretty overwhelming and many of you came into the channel through the Comet 2019 Y4 Atlas and it's we had a nice run but unfortunately I have an update for you if you haven't seen the news and that is the comet has fragmented, the nucleus has broken apart and this is somewhat common for this type of comet as it gets closer to the sun and heats up and Oh, this is Kylo. This is our cat, Kylo. <laughs> so, hey bud, what's up? Um, so the comet is fragmented and it's not going to live up to expectations as we head into that May time period. So temper your expectations. Look, stay up to date by going to these two websites I'll put down on the page below. Spaceweather.com and Universe Today. Those are great resources to stay up to date on the comet. However, we have a new comet. This one is called 2020 F8 Swan. It's in the Southern Hemisphere right now. So it's not available to us in the Northern Hemisphere, but for you in the Southern Hemisphere, enjoy comet 2020 F8 Swan. I believe we get to see it coming in to the next couple of weeks and I believe it's going to be in our morning sky. And we're again looking at that time frame of that May 15th. So in the morning, May 15th, we're hoping that uh, Comet Swan, we'll just call it Comet Swan, really puts on a show. And that's the one we're watching. So our purpose today is to dive into M51, Lord Rossi's Nebula or the Whirlpool Galaxy. This is what my project over the last few weeks, and I kind of visit this object about every April as we're in galaxy season. And, but what I thought was interesting as I was doing my research on this, of course, the Schmidt Telescope by Marx and Pfau, uh, this is a fantastic book even today. This book is, I believe, in the early 90s published. But you can see their cover photograph is of the Whirlpool Galaxy, M51. Hans Varenberg's Atlas of Deep Sky Splendors. I thought what was amazing about this is he goes into the plate that they took. Now this book was published in the early 80s and the plates were largely taken throughout the 70s, uh, late 70s. And so this is a plate, this is a, you can see the field of view that are associated with Schmidt cameras because this tiny dot here is M51. So it's a relatively large field. They're generally three degrees, four degrees by two to three degrees. Well, what was fascinating is this Varenberg, the author, was lamenting the fact that in this 75 minute exposure, he had two satellites cross the field. And he goes on to discuss how he tracked down exactly what those satellites were. They were two Russian Cosmos satellites. And he laments the issue of satellites in astrophotographs. Now that's such a contemporary topic today as Elon Musk is launching the Skynet network. So many people are having conversations about the impact of satellites on our night sky and on photography. 
So I thought that was an interesting cross bridging to almost 50 years ago, the same topic we think is current, but this thing was, this thing was being brought up 50 years ago by prominent astrophotographers of the day. So that's a little bit of an insight into M51. We're going to dive into a little bit more detail on what M51 is, where you can find it, where you can visually see it, exactly what, what went into me taking this uh, photograph from a technical standpoint. So let's dive into all that right now. centered um, line that we're working on and pretty happy with what we're getting here in raw footage everything in difficulty goes up when you increase focal length and exposure times this is a 15 minute exposure i'm going in sets of four i've done a gain of 150 you can see my temperature Okay, let's take a look at some of the data that we gathered. It's been probably over a month here, just as sporadic night skies cooperate, clear night skies cooperate. And the first data I really gathered actually was a year ago. And this is with the light pollution filter uh, last year. I believe this was probably around two and a half hours of exposure time. And you can see it has a little bit of a it accentuates the blues a fair amount, but it really does a nice job on galaxies. It gives you a little bit more of a natural contrast. Then this year, I added a lot of new data. This was unfiltered and about three hours worth of data, really nice and clean. If you go in here to 100%, uh, you can see that the data looks really good. That's pretty clean. And uh, just have to take care of the hot core and work on some color, but that's a that's a pretty nice set of data there then i also over the last couple of weeks added some hydrogen alpha now you got to remember this is an f12 system so it's really slow so i use my stc filter to gather the hydrogen alpha of course there's some uh, o3 being gathered with that as well m51 has these great hydrogen alpha sections you can see here that just pop out with the uh, stc Narrow, dual narrowband filter. So that's really nice data to add as a complement to the total. So then in PixInsight, I went into this NR, uh, NBRGB combination, narrowband, red, uh, blue, green combination. And you can see here, it just really accentuates the data. Uh, the hydrogen alpha sections really start to pop out in the uh, the core of the galaxy that's really a nice option to blend in that hydrogen alpha and so this is the final image that comes about from combining all of those so this is my m51 for 2020 i don't think i'm going to add any more data to it i really favor gem misty image that's in my sky safari app that i think is really well color balanced it's blue stars these are these are really new young uh, blue stars in this area here so i don't like to oversaturate it i think for a what is like a native um, six seven hundred millimeter focal length refractor with a barlow lens on the on the end of it to take it to f12 and 1500 millimeter focal length i'm really happy with this and i don't really use decon deconvolution i just use smart sharp in photoshop to apply some sharpening here into the core of the galaxy. Uh, I really need to get better with deconvolution, but this is my M51 for this year. And if you go to uh, the AstroBin page, you can see here it does some astrometry 
for us in this galaxy up here is called IC4278. And the galaxy that seems to be interacting with M51 or the Whirlpool Galaxy, but it's just nearby, it has interacted with it. That is NGC5195. So that does a nice job on the astrometry. So that's kind of the image processing behind it and how things came together on my M51 for April of uh, 2020. This is the way it looked last night. So this was April 18th at about 10 p.m. You can see the Whirlpool Galaxies up here now. It's in the constellation Canis Venetici. That doesn't pop up until you really zoom in. There you can see that constellation. But it's really associated as just being off of that a Big Dipper star or Ursa Major star called Alcade. And so in the, at this particular time of year in April, it's in the would be the northeast, just east of the meridian, getting close to the zenith. And as I progress here hourly, you can see how it progresses across the sky. And at about one o'clock, it's near the meridian and near the zenith. And so it's up on pretty much the entire night at this time of year. And depending on when you go out, will determine which part of the sky you need to look at. But that's uh, Whirlpool Galaxy and in this app, you can go into the object information, and this is the image that I refer to. It's uh, Jim Misty's M51 image, which uh, I think is just one of the best amateur images taken. I love the color balance in that. I think it really accurately presents the blue in the arms, the core details, and the uh, interacting uh, galaxy. But you can see here it's called Whirlpool Galaxy, Lord Rossi's Nebula, or the question mark. Now the distance, I've seen all kinds of numbers everywhere from 30, 37 million light years away down to, I believe, 25 million light years away is one of the references in here. So there have been a couple of supernova over the last few decades that have helped us really try to dial in that distance, but somewhere in the 20 plus million light years away period. And its visual magnitudes around eight, a little bit brighter, uh, about 7.92. So it's real easy to find. It's 3.5 degrees southeast of Eta Ursa Majoris. That's the easternmost star in the handle of the Big Dipper's handle. In binoculars, scan the sky, dark adapt your eyes, get to as dark a sky as possible. Don't go out with the moon up in the sky and uh, you should be able to find it. And it's just, it's one of our best face on spiral galaxies. It's they believe about the size of our Milky Way galaxy. Of course, it has that one interacting uh, NGC galaxy uh, nearby. I highly encourage you to go out and check it out. It's a fantastic visual object. Get to a star party to see it through a large scope or take a shot at it photographically. You need a little bit of focal length. The size is 13.7 by 11.7 arc minutes. So that's a relatively small size of an object to try to photograph. So probably focal lengths of a thousand millimeters or more are going to really help give you the scale necessarily to uh, needed to bring out some of that detail. So, but that's M51, a great object at this time of year in April, great spring galaxy season, and I encourage you to check it out. Until our next video, I want to encourage you to get out, check out the skies, get your camera out, try to take some photographs. We've got the summer Milky Way that's starting to rise early in the morning, and there's a great planetary dance that's happening with Jupiter, Saturn, and Mars. Uh, the moon gets involved there. It's early morning throughout the month of uh, April into May. So it's going to be a nice, nice dance of the planets that's going to happen. So check out the early morning skies over the next few weeks. And until next time, thanks for stopping by. Thanks for subscribing. And as always, clear skies.